what I said to Jordan Peterson was actually a dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throw him in hellfire for what he said. I meant it. I meant every word. Go to hell. I, that was a dua for me. And it's not like we didn't know this was going to happen. I think the scale is what is shocking to people right now, the audacity of the genocide that's taking place in such a quick period of time and, and the way that it's been enabled. The people of Gaza don't have expectations of this dunya. They've already been primed. I mean, they go to sleep truly not knowing if they're going to wake up. They literally do this all the time. So I got up there. I spoke right before the prime minister. Trudeau spoke right after me. Then I came to find out. I got text messages like, hey, you know they cut your, your stream midway through your speech. I was talking to someone who works at, I don't want to give up an identity at CBC, but knows like what's happening at CBC and said, mm -hmm. yeah, like they, they always keep a 30 second lag so that if things go wild, they can, you know, move away from yeah. it. So as soon as you said Palestine, cut. And what was the excuse they used? technical difficulties. I want to be very real about this. This is a time for courage. How we react in this moment as a community is going to really shape the way that this issue can be discussed for generations to come, decades to come here. So this is a time for courage. My university never lets me teach a class again. So be it. If I never get invited to mainstream spaces again, or if I get kicked out of every one of those, I'm okay. That's a badge of honor for us to sacrifice for Palestine. This is a time where we band together and we don't accept the intimidation. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي شحري صدري ويسري أمري وحل الأقدام النساني يفقه قولي فما بعد ما الله سبحانه وتعالى أنتيني ناس from our tongue expand for us our chest allow us to speak the truth allow us to be alone in the room without the influence of shaitan may Allah سبحانه وتعالى forgive us for any slips and mistakes may Allah سبحانه وتعالى allow us to be leaders for the men to to bring people towards Islam and to be leaders for the righteous اللهم آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته welcome to the realest podcast in the dunya the three Muslims alhamdulillah we are blessed with Finally, being with our brother Imam Omar Sulaiman. Salam alaikum. How are you doing today? Alhamdulillah. 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 He's very tall in person. Allahumma barak. He's tall in person. Allah bless him. We're the same height. <laughs> <laughs> hey, give or take a uh, foot. <laughs> same height in Jannah, right? Inshallah. Inshallah. Same height in Jannah. Alhamdulillah. So, um, Sheikh, something that stood out to me very recently um, was your response to Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. um, when he he tweeted. To uh, in response to the October 7th attack, he said, give him hell, Netanyahu. And you responded by saying, go to hell. Um, yeah. I think it was one of the first times I, I've seen you take a very staunch stance against uh, someone in public like that. Mm. And uh, I think it was, it, for me, it was very impactful. And I think a lot of people really appreciated that from you as well. So what was your response to the overall situation? So here's the backstory to that. Um, on Tuesday nights, I actually teach a course called The First... Um, at Yaqeen, we take one of the Sahaba and we cover the Sahabi uh, for that week. And I just finished, subhanAllah, funny enough, the um, the lectures about the shuhada of Bi'r Ma'una and Haditha al rajir two massacres that took place after Uhud, wow. after the Prophet Sallallahu So actually more people were killed, more companions were killed in what was a sneak attack, basically. I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu was betrayed. The khutbah was about to, right? They, they told the Prophet Sallallahu sent some ambassadors to teach us the Qur'an. The Prophet Sallallahu sent some of the best sahaba. More people were massacred in that sneak attack in Bi'r Ma'una and uh, al Rajir massacre than Uhud. Wow. So this is right after Uhud. And the Prophet Sallallahu made dua against those people for a whole month, every salah, at the end of every salah. Wow. So our Prophet Sallallahu in Uhud was saying, Allahumma khfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. When they were knocking in his own helmet and they were knocking his teeth, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they were almost, they almost were able to kill him. He still was saying, may Allah forgive my people, they don't know any better. But then in Rajir and Ma'una, when they killed his companions that way, in such a nasty way, such a deceptive way, pure betrayal, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua against those tribes, five salawat for a month. And so I was having this conversation with the community that, look, this is a side from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we also need to... Uh, look at it. it wasn't the norm of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I was not sent as a la'an. I wasn't sent uh, to curse people. But he did make dua against people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the occasion called for it. Uh, so what I said to Jordan Peterson was actually a dua. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala throw him in hellfire for what he said. I meant it. I meant every word. Go to hell. I, that was a dua for me. Because for him to say that, and we see the result, and it's not like we didn't know 
this was going to happen. I think the scale is what is shocking to people right now, the audacity of the genocide that's taking place in such a quick period of time and, and the way that it's been enabled by um, the United States and others. But we knew that, you know, it's not the first time Gaza gets bombed and little children are decimated into pieces. So uh, we knew what was going to happen. And so um, I meant that, Dura. And, and to be honest with you, I think it's, it's important, you know, I was sharing with, with you guys on the way here, that, you know, it's interesting. People question the existence of a hellfire. The hellfire is a mercy sometimes to the oppressed to know that the oppressor will, will have to face the consequences for the things that they say and the things that they do. And so especially in this situation, I mean, obviously his final hukum is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his final judgment is with Allah, but um, the situation I think called for it, that, you know, you invoke a punishment on our innocent brothers and sisters in Gaza, so we yeah. invoke a punishment on you in response. You know, me personally, I I can't help but get those those thoughts of like, why doesn't Allah just, you know, like destroy the oppressors? Why doesn't Allah just save, you know, the innocent people? But obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he addresses that in the Quran. He mentions that he allows these things to happen so he can take shahada, he can take martyrs. Um, and I thought about like from the non-Muslim, from the wrongdoers perspective, Allah is letting them build a case against themselves. Like, like they're worsening the hisab for them on the day of judgment. And that is something that uh, it really stuck with me, subhanAllah. And Allah, la yumli hatta idha akhada wa right? So Allah will let the, the oppressor drink his own Kool-Aid, think that he's he has that power. So until he intoxicates himself with that power, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will snatch him and Allah will not let him go. Wow. And that's why the the not mention the ayah, wa ma kana rabbuka nasiya, your Lord does not forget is a comfort for the oppressed and is a warning to the oppressor. Wow. Because sometimes when a person has been oppressed for a long time or, you know, times have passed and it seems like there was no recourse in this dunya, a person might think to themselves, am I going to get my justice or not? And Allah is saying, your Lord has not for forgotten. Yeah. And for the oppressor, the oppressor might move on and say, well, nothing happened to me. I didn't get struck by lightning. I'm still living my life. Your Lord has not forgotten. Nothing makes sense in the question of evil, especially when there are oppressed people without the existence of the hereafter. Yeah. So we're on a continuum of time, right? And so this is a period of our existence, not our entire existence. If this is our entire existence, then it's misery and senseless. Yeah. But we know it's not our entire existence. And the shuhada of Gaza know that it's not their entire existence. And that's, that's something that's deeply profound is that Sometimes we're having a faith crisis that the people that are experiencing the worst of the material crisis are not even having. You know, they themselves have more iman experiencing it than us watching it, which yeah. is which is really stunning, right? You're having a faith crisis here watching on your computer, on your phone. They're not having a faith crisis over there. They're having a crisis because it is savagery and butchery. But they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they're not losing their iman. So it's important for us to to really use this moment to strengthen our iman. You know, yeah. people re remove God from the equation because they think that's going to offer them comfort. Yeah. Because I can't make sense of it, therefore no one else can make sense of it. And so what does that mean? You live shaqi, as the Prophet ﷺ said, deprived. Mm. You know, shaqi, it's an interesting word. Um, the Prophet ﷺ said when you're in your mother's womb, Allah writes you down as Sa'id or shaqi, as one who is happy or one who is deprived. And this person is deprived when they're unable to believe in something greater than what they can see. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. It's amazing. And it, I mean, that's something that has really shocked me. And not just me, even like, you know, not even Muslims, just non-Muslims as well. When people have accepted Islam recently, just seeing mm -hmm. the people of Gaza and how they are reacting to the situation. I, I heard one, one um, uh, speaker recently, he said that his family called him and told him, you know, just, just, just be patient. The yeah. person in Gaza called the, the Canadian family members, telling the Canadian to be patient, subhanAllah. I actually want to share a subhanAllah story that I'd given a talk last Tuesday or the Tuesday before, actually last Tuesday night, um, about, um, you know, are we allowed to take a break from watching this? How do we proceed with our everyday life? Like, are we supposed mm -hmm. to have weddings? Are we supposed to still do our nikahs? Are we still supposed to go to work, are we still, because there's a sense of just, we're not able to live right now, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talked about the importance of ghafla uh, being avoided, heedlessness, right? So you don't go from 
what kills the heart is you go from, you know, the real of the dead baby to the funny reel that makes you laugh. Yeah. That's going to kill your heart. Or, you know, go from that to like haram to lighten up your heart or lighten up your mood or whatever it is. You know, I'm going to take a break, so I'm going to watch something lewd and vulgar. I'm going to take a break, so I'm going to go do something that's inappropriate. Or extravagance, israf in this time, which which in a lot of weddings, there's a lot of israf, right, and extravagance. But the Prophet ﷺ still taught society to function, even in the midst of a great crisis. And subhanAllah, after I gave the talk, there was a brother from Gaza that sent a message uh, to a, a relative of his in my community. So this wasn't someone directly to me, but he's in Gaza. And he was saying, I listened to the talk, and he said, Jazakallah khair. And he said, uh, tell Shaykh Omar, min uh, haqqikum alayna. From your right upon us is that we feel joy for your for your happiness. And min haqqina alaykum, from our right upon you, is that you don't forget us even in your joy. That you make dua for us even in your joy. I, I read that message mm-hmm. in Arabi. It's very, I mean, it's just very profound. Like even they're still thinking like, yeah, he's absolutely right. And they are, subhanAllah, when you talk about resilience, the people of Gaza, one of the things that drives Israel crazy about Gaza is that no matter how much they have tried to break them down psychologically, they insist upon life. You know, that idea like, you know, Muslims are being framed as a people that just teach death. This is teaching life. The fact that like they still rebuild their schools, they still find their joy, they still find their ability to function. Like they're not sitting around after the airstrikes usually and just, you know, we give up. No, like they, Mm -hmm. subhanAllah, they, they, they rebuild. Obviously, this time Allah knows how this one's going to play out, but they rebuild and they they reconstruct and then they they just get right back to it. And that's something that's very admirable about the people, that resilience that they have in that regard. I have a question though. What do you think causes that difference? So you have these people who are going through everything and they have yakin. Yeah. But then you have people who are like us, we're watching and our faith is over here wavering. I think that I go back to a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu I shared it, um, you know, when, when uh, I went to the funeral of uh, with the, the six-year-old boy that was killed in Chicago, stabbed 26 times, and they had his coffin, his, his coffin was covered with the Palestinian flag, and it just it felt like very unreal. And the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he said, كَيْفَ أَنْعُمْ How can I find joy when I've seen Israfil? Uh, السلام, and his lips are already puckered to the horn and he's staring at the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his eyes fixated like stars ready to blow waiting for the command from Allah كيف أنعم means how can I have an appetite for this dunya how can I have an appetite for this world one of my um, mashayikh said something deeply profound years ago when, when he went through a trial um, I've quoted him uh, and he said the only way this dunya can disappoint you is if you have expectations of it and truly, if you have expectations of this world, it will disappoint you. If you don't have expectations of this dunya, it's not going to disappoint you. Yeah. And, and the people of Gaza don't have expectations of this dunya. They've already been primed. I mean, they go to sleep, truly, not knowing if they're going to wake up. Um, now, all of us should ideally be going to sleep with the idea that we potentially might not wake up. And that mm-hmm. should give us a certain sense of seriousness and attachment. But I mean, they, they literally do this all the time, right? And so it's not like this yaqeen is found overnight. It's generated over time. Iman is built. Yaqeen is built. Certainty is built and established. And when you have it over a long period of time, then you're able to to really withstand uh, in the long run. SubhanAllah. You know, there's another hadith of Prophet. If, if, if you know it, please jump in and, and say for me. Because I don't remember the full hadith. But Prophet was telling the Sahaba about, you know, there will come a time um, and I forget the exact hadith, but obviously not not a great time for the Muslims. And they asked, "Will this be because um, we're small in numbers?" And then Prophet mm-hmm. said, "said He said, no. You're going to be numerous, but you're going to be like like rubbish, basically, to to the non-Muslims, and they're going to be killing you." Yeah, so you were going to be like the the phone. Oh, so that's yeah, but that's a separate hadith. But yeah, he did say that, right. and we are like that nowadays. And I mean, at least to me, that's what it seems like. So he said, like, but you're going to be like the scum and like the rubbish, you know, to these people, and he mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this time he will take the fear of the Muslims out of the hearts of the enemies. So they won't fear us, they won't care about us, we're like nothing to them. And then he says that in, in the hearts of the Muslim is going to be two things. He said there's going to be love of the dunya and fear of death. Right. And, and 
Yeah, and that's the exact, almost the exact opposite of what, you know, the people in Gaza have, just like you were saying. You know, they don't expect much from a life. And for them, death is just, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a step towards Jannah, inshallah, martyrdom for them and their people. Seeing the resilience, well, it, it, it makes me want to cry. These people, may Allah SWT bless them and, and, and free and liberate them. It's, it's, it's beautiful. So I did a lecture called The Living Martyrs in the Hospitals of Gaza mm -hmm. because I actually was just looking at the tafsir of Bal Ahya, rather they're alive. Rather they're alive, rather they're alive. Like what made us different in this regard, right, is that they they know that something else exists beyond this life. So they have something that their enemy does not have. And because they know that something exists beyond this life, they don't cling on to this life in a way that ins inspires cowardice or uh, hesitation because they see it as a necessary step. And subhanAllah, that idea of al-wahan, when the Prophet ﷺ was talking about like, حُبَّ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَاهِيَةُ الموت, You love this dunya too much and you, uh, you start to hate death. It's uh, these two things are are inherently tied to each other. If you go to a graveyard to visit, one of the sunan of the Prophet ﷺ is ziyarat al qubur to go and visit to remind yourself of death. You go make du'a for the deceased and you remind yourself of death. Right? Is this so, a Muslim graveyard or any? Well, so that's an interesting situation, uh, especially when we live amongst non-Muslims. Obviously, assalamu alaikum, ya raqam mu'minin, the du'a that you would make for the believing souls when you walk into a Muslim graveyard, things of that sort. But uh, if you're driving by or you're walking by and you see a graveyard, it's a graveyard, period. And that's a chance for you to actually sit and to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, but certainly visiting the, the graveyard uh, is, is uh, uh, something that instills in us a reminder of death. And the Prophet sallallahu said, إِنِّي نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ I used to forbid you from visiting the graves because in the original part of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ wanted the uh, creed to settle in to people's hearts. So there are a lot of practices that take place around, and subhanAllah even now, right, a lot of practices and stuff that take place around the graves and around death. So for the majority of Islam, the only time you went to the graveyard was when you were burying someone. And then in the last three years, the Prophet ﷺ said, I, have, I used to forbid you, from visiting the graves, but now visit them because it reminds you of death. Yeah. So when you make du'a for the deceased, whether you make du'a for the deceased from your home or next to the person's grave, it's going to reach, inshallah ta'ala, for that person. The benefit will reach of maghfirah, inshallah ta'ala, what you're doing. But visit, and that will remind you, inshallah ta'ala, of death because you need that reminder. So the people of Gaza, their whole, their whole city is a graveyard right now. So the appetite of this dunya will reduce in a person. Now with that being said, subhanAllah, the Prophet still used to smile all the time. The Prophet still, like he wouldn't come home and and hit the floor and like, you know, I, I have no no desire for for my uh, spouse, I have no desire for food, I have no, no like, and just talk about death. The Prophet still was able to live a full life in that sense, but he never lost perspective. And what Allah Azza wa Jal warns us from is ghafla, heedlessness. When you become heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and heedless of the reality of this life, then you're going to become a victim of it. You'll become beholden to it. The dunya sijnul mu'min, this world is the prison of the believer and it is the jannah, jannah al kafir. It is the paradise of the disbeliever. Why? Because if, you know, for us, no matter what goodness we experience here, we expect a greater goodness. Right, and for the wicked one, right, no matter what goodness they experience here, what comes next is going to be worse. Mm -hmm. uh, Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah was one day walking. Ibn Hajar is a very famous scholar in Islam. He was one day walking, and uh, he was in Egypt, and he had like a really nice outfit. He used to dress nicely. He was he was relatively well off, one of the greatest scholars in the history of Islam. And he was walking in the marketplace, and there was a a, a person who wasn't Muslim who uh, saw him. Uh, walking, and this person was like sort of a, a more simple person. And he said to Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he said, Didn't your Prophet say that uh, this life is a jannah for the disbeliever and a prison for the believer? And he said, Yes. And he said, What type of jannah am I in, and what type of prison are you in? Like, look at you and look at me. That doesn't look like a prison, and this doesn't look like a paradise. And Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, responded, and he said, What I expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in comparison to this dunya. Mm -hmm. This dunya is a prison. Wow. 
Yes. And what you can expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in comparison to this dunya, this dunya is a jannah for you. So the hereafter is the game changer. It is the equalizer for us as believers. In happiness and in sadness, in hardship and in ease, in life and in death, we're always programmed to think about what we want in the akhirah. What tarjuna min Allahi ma la yarjun. You want something different from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than them. Mm. You expect something different from Allah. And so that should give you a different type of heart and a different type of firmness and steadfastness as you as you you know live your your life inshallah in accordance with the hopes of the hereafter subhanallah Shaykh. but you said and forgive me for a second but you said that uh something that these brothers and sisters have is that you know they know that after what's coming after is much better than what is now but what if now this so-called enemy they also too believe and this after and they believe that it's only for them like what then you know what Allah Azza wa says because that will come right at some point you'll find two groups of people that are fighting uh, against each other that believe in different you know things and different types of uh, you know dispensations in the, in the hereafter um, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادَ يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحَبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ So there are people that have taken partners besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They love them the way they should love Allah. But the way you love Allah, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ The believers love Allah so much more than what anyone else loves anything else. Okay? So whatever attachment that anyone has garnered to anything else, the believer's attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than that attachment. Therefore, it will yield more in this life and in the next. So mm. when when we believe in Allah and we believe in the hereafter, right, it's, it's greater than the belief that anyone else has. It should be greater than the belief that anyone else has. So do you really think that uh, Abu Jahad believed in his idols the way that Umar radiallahu anhu believed in Allah? Absolutely not. Right? Yeah. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. So it's it's the way we love Allah should be different than the way that anyone else loves anything else. Mm. Sheikh, you were briefly mentioning something that happened in Canada. Do you want to go into that story? Yeah, uh, we're talking about with Trudeau. With Trudeau, so yes. Canadian. So we're gonna let me just face towards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, totally. I used to be Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were. T- I think we were talking about um, a lot of things that are happening right now and. You know, even today's khutbah is about like hypocrisy and betrayal and the double standards, right? The masks are falling from the so-called human rights defenders of the world. The masks are falling from those that preach, um, you know, superior moral ground. The masks are falling all over the place, right? It's very interesting because um, in London, in Canada, people think London, UK, London, Canada, there was a Muslim family that was run over by a, a hateful man. Uh, may Allah have mercy on them all. So an Islamophobe basically ran them over with his car, his whole family. May Allah just accept them all as shuhada. And it shook the community. And I had gone for the one year, um, you know, uh, so it happened in COVID time. So it was everything was shut down. So they wanted to obviously have an event against hate. So it was one year after the, the incident took place. Uh, so I went to London and... Um, Prime Minister Trudeau was coming. I didn't know he was coming. Uh, and the reason why they didn't share that he was coming in advance, I guess, is because they have something called the trucker protests in Canada. Yeah. So, like, he couldn't even announce at that time. I guess it had gotten so significant where he was going to be in advance. So next thing I know, I find out he's going to be sitting next to me. So I'm like, all right, my speech is going to become about not just Islamophobia here, but it's going to extend to Palestine. And at that time, India was, was India, by the way, still is a, a deep problem. What's happening in India is very much so tied to what's happening uh, to the Palestinians because uh, Hindu and, and, and Zionism are two twin ideologies and Modi is very much so learning from, you know, the Netanyahu playbook, uh, even bulldozing homes and things of that sort. So I said to myself, all right, here's my opportunity. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to talk about Palestine and, and India and sort of the global uh, hatred of Muslims and how that all come, stems from the same thing because you can't claim to be against the hatred of Islam and Muslims here, but then frame Islam and Muslims in such a hateful way around the world with both your words and your policy. Mm. I got. I said, all right, Bismillah, here we go. So I got up there, I spoke right before the Prime Minister, uh, started off talking about the hatred, obviously, that, that took the lives of that family and then extended it to Palestine. 
extended to India. I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is great national Canadian broadcast, inshallah ta'ala, we finally broke through, got the message across. Uh, the prime minister spoke right after me, Trudeau spoke right after me. And then I came to find out, I got text messages like, hey, you know they cut your, your stream uh, midway through your speech. So I was talking to someone who uh, works at, I don't want to give up an identity at CBC, but knows like what's happening at CBC and said, mm-hmm. yeah, like they, they always keep a 30 second lag so that if things go wild, they can, you know, move away yeah. from it. So as soon as you said Palestine, cut, right? It immediately cut you off. Oh and then the stream came back. And what was the excuse they used? Technical difficulties or whatever it is. Oh so God. God. Selective technical difficulties. Selective so technical. the censorship is, is, is significant, right? And especially we're seeing it right now with... Um, Subhanallah, what, what I'm what I'm encouraged by, though, honestly speaking, what I'm encouraged by, is right now we're under the weight of the entire Western political establishment. All legacy mainstream media and social media companies are like, you know, banning our pages and like taking down our stuff constantly. And still, still, public opinion is actually shifting on Palestine, yeah. because people people are still finding ways to expose themselves to what's actually happening in mm-hmm. Palestine. Mm-hmm. So the weight of that establishment and the weight of all of that money that is thrown towards, um, you know, uh, dehumanizing the Palestinians, alhamdulillah, I mean, I think that we are making strides and and bringing awareness to what's actually happening over there. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, ya Rab. So my question now is people hear about what's happening. They learn the truth. What should the Muslims, I I guess I want to focus on, be doing in this time what what would you say is the obligation upon the muslim community so there are multiple obligations or multiple ways to be impactful depending upon your particular circumstances yeah um obviously it starts with a dua it starts with a dua dua is the weapon of the believer yeah no one can cut your access to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dua no one can cut the access of the people of gaza to allah with their dua to 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 actually immerse yourself in sincere supplication as you plead to the one who has more power than anyone or anything that you would appeal to to make change mm-hmm. is your greatest obligation to your brothers and sisters in Gaza right now. So exert yourself in dua and do not belittle your dua, the potential of your dua to actually change the world. Um, you know, shaitan can kind of play with their heads and say, well, what's my dua going to do for these people, right? And they're so much righteous, more righteous than me. But it may be that Allah uses your dua as a spark, as a catalyst for something that has changed. So yeah. that's that. And on a spiritual level, because we're spiritual people, um, you know, or, or we see the, the role of, of spirituality in all of this as well. Islah enough to fix yourself, to rectify yourself is very important. Um, because you're a part of this Muslim body. And if you're the weak weak part of the body then you're not helping the other part of the body that's in pain right now mm. so hold your weight yeah. you know mm. strengthen strengthen your part of the body your sins affect the body right and your righteousness strengthens the body hold your mm. weight you know you're part of the body um you know you guys look like you work out so when you uh when when you lift there are certain muscles that get worked out by extension that sometimes are not listed on the machine right but that that helps strengthen the entirety right yeah. so where are you on the body and then strengthen your part of the body right and hold your own in that sense mm-hmm. i think after that it's learning educating yourself about the reality because you need to you need to be equipped well equipped to take on some of the arguments that you're going to get mm. um so, so that you don't just get into emotional um manipulative you know exchanges in your workplace or in whatever it is right actually educate yourself on the history yeah. of palestine i'd recommend there's the 100 year war on palestine by rashid khalidi it's very yeah very easy way to sort of get you get yourself caught up to speed but read a, a bit about the history of what's happened there uh, read the apartheid reports by by human rights watch and amnesty yeah. about why israel is indeed an apartheid state uh, so you can be well equipped because they want to freeze you into October. And you're like, no, this is 75 years. So yeah. educate yourself so that you can be more equipped when you're having these types of uh, discussions. Um, get involved in your local efforts uh, to to try to bring about awareness. Obviously, you're bringing awareness online, inshallah ta'ala. But if there are means of peaceful protest, means of, um, means of, of putting pressure in different ways, inshallah ta'ala, that work within the collective, they do matter. So involve yeah. yourself in that. 
uh, boycott. I think I think that there's something to say about not just the Muslim ability or or people of you know people who are engaged in this to say like I'm not going to buy I'm going to sacrifice this particular product and we're going to do that collectively because this company has shown absolutely no regard for um, for for our brothers and sisters' lives and so uh, we'll sink that company economically. Uh, the BDS movement, by the way. The boycott, divestment, sanctions movement is a very powerful movement. There's a reason why there are anti-boycott laws on on the books of 38 states in the United States because yeah. Israel fears the the BDS movement, uh, fears the concept of of boycott um, because it, it it's 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 a viable economic power that people can can collectively exercise mm -hmm. that can have meaningful consequences. Um, you know, when it comes to when it comes to these uh, these companies and stuff like that. So. There's something even like, you know, if, if you, you know, with your kids, right? So my kids get really annoyed about some of the things that we can't do anymore. We can't buy anymore. But it's like, hey, look, you see these kids dying in Gaza. You have an obligation to them. You got to nurture that in them early on with your kids. You know, my kids are young, but they they understand enough. My older two, at least like, hey, look, like we're going to feel a little bit of a pinch and we're going to give up some conveniences because we want to be, we want to help the cause. Uh, don't say, well, we're just two people. Or we're just, no, no, that's. If the if if people take on collective action, then it can have um, very meaningful um, consequences. Inshallah, Taala, and keep raising awareness. However, you do. I think there are targeted. Then there are specific ways that we can protect ourselves. Inshallah, Taala, and, um, and and advocate for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, we can build capacity. So not everyone has the the the, the leeway in their employment to be able to to go to certain places mm -hmm. some people have certain skills right now we need to legally protect our ability mm -hmm. to call out israel for what it is without facing consequences right so if you can build capacity legally build capacity legally punish politicians you know uh you know with in, in the ways that hurt them politically whatever it is yeah. that you have inshallah to try to build capacity and make change. So, Sheikh, I was going to ask you an important question. Before we even get to that stage, how does the average layman overcome this whole walking on eggshells type of mentality where we fear losing our jobs, we fear getting kicked out of uni, we fear our banks, bank accounts being closed, we feel being put put behind bars? So those are very different things, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a broad spectrum that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I want to be very real about this. Um, this is a time for courage. This is a time for courage. This is a time for courage. How we react in this moment as a community is going to potentially shape the way that this issue can be discussed for generations to come, decades to come here. So this is a time for courage. Uh, this is a time where we band together and we don't accept the intimidation. I get it. It's easy for me to say, right? I, I, I work at Yaqeen. So, I mean, I'm not going to, inshallah, get fired for Yaqeen for, from Yaqeen for being pro-Palestinian. Uh, my university never lets me teach a class again. So be it. I, I'm okay with that. If I never get invited to mainstream spaces again or whatever, if I get kicked out of every one of those, I'm okay. That's a badge of honor for us to sacrifice for Palestine, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm, I, I also recognize that, that I'm not putting my my bread and my and, and my, my, my butter on the line here because this isn't really financially costly. So I do feel for people that, you know, I've gotten into med schools and that I've gotten, you know, far in their careers um, that want to speak but that have been deeply intimidated I think there are a few ways around that. Number one, um, just a principle. If you can't speak the truth, then don't speak falsehood. That's number one. This is a principle that we have. If you can't speak the haq, don't speak batad. Mm -hmm. So do not um, sign your name or, or, or participate in anything that's actually going to undermine um, you know, your faith in this regard. And this is not just true for Palestine. This is true for, for beyond that, right? Different things. Number two, weigh the effectiveness of your speech. Number three, their strength in numbers. A lot of the people that get fired, it's because they went on social media and they just went off on their Instagram story. It probably wasn't that effective in the moment, right? But if you found six, seven people in your department or, you know, in your, in your you know, workplace and you put out some sort of an internal, you know, uh, memo and then an external statement that, look, we, you know, we're outraged by Palestinian suffering right now, a very well-worded, well-thought-out statement, then that's probably more effective and it can become precedent for other you know, types of spaces where other students in different universities are trying to fight back or other um, staff members in different companies are trying to fight back, right? So be smart and effective, um, but be courageous, 
Mm. So be smart and effective, but be courageous. This is not a time to back down. Um, now, if you get to a point where it's like, look, um, you know, I can, I can by, by playing a little bit more of a, a timid role to an extent, not speaking bothered, but maybe not speaking as forcefully as I can, but I'm, I'm, I'm making some moves within this very important space to where I can usher in the ability for people to speak um, in a stronger way, then, then alhamdulillah, but do it with shura, do it with sincerity, mm. consult. So we do need to be effective. So I, I don't want people to, like we live, in, we live in a world, unfortunately, where like something you tweeted out when you're 14 can ruin your life when you're 40. It's pretty crazy. Uh, when you think about it, right, 25, 30 years old and you get somewhere in life and you and then someone pulls out an old post, an old tweet and you're done. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we have to we have to be smart. Yeah. We have to be strategic, but we have to be courageous. This is a time for courage, uh, not a time for us to back down and accept the intimidation. So now speaking about courage, a lot of brothers and sisters have been at the forefront of these protests and there's shiur issuing fatawa saying, Taram, free mixing, all this type of stuff. You know, what are your thoughts on that? I think that look, there there are a few things. Number one, not everyone has to be in every space. Mm. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, I think the dynamics in certain countries are going to be different. Um, so, for example, the implication of that, like in London, a lot of the mashayikh joined that protest. A lot of good brothers joined that protest. It was a hist I mean, we all saw the scenes of that protest around the world. And the people of Gaza saw the scenes too, by the way, they were circulating it in Palestine, like 500,000 people, 300 to 500,000 people on the London bridge all over is, is incredible. Right. So they obviously like can't, you know, separate things out or they can't completely make that protest. Um, you know, according to as a whole, you know, what would fall in the guidelines uh, of, of the Sharia. Um, but, you know, they kind of carve their space out. They kind of march as a contingency. You know, you speak and then you kind of leave, um, bring sort of an Islamic flavor to it, um, you know, where it's in a substantive way, not just like a, a cover to it, but in a substantive way, um, dua and and changing changing your your part of that environment, right? Like this is very different from a Muslim country, you know. Uh, I don't. There isn't a single large protest in the West that is not going to have some objectionable elements that are mixed, that are mentioned here, right? So it is a judgment call. Um, it is something that people have to engage very thoughtfully and, and thoroughly. Um, it is something where you know, for me, I think that, um, and this is, I'm saying this. With, with the full recognition that I could be wrong and, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correct me if that is the case. Um, the moment right now that we're in is so crucial, especially again because as loud as the political and media establishments have been with the Zionist narrative, the streets are fighting back in the sense that, that the, the loudness of the streets, the images, the the, the voice of, of, of normal people um, is is really giving something back it's pushing back and we we want we want to save people's lives right now like let's not this is not a small inconsequential thing so when there's something that's effective in doing so not in not in and of itself but in in concert with a bunch of other actions inshallah ta'ala mm -hmm. um i don't think it's wise to forsake the space altogether what I'd recommend to, to Muslims to do is when you engage these spaces, try to have conversations with the organizers in advance, uh, try to make the religious accommodations as much as possible in advance. Um, you know, one thing that, that like, uh, inshallah, I'm going to be heading to the DC protest. It's organized by a coalition of more organizations. I mean, organizations I've never even heard of, right? But, you know, it starts at two o'clock. I spoke to the organizer. I said, look, can we do Salat al-Jama'ah? Can we pray Dhuhr? Because it would be very powerful. You're going to have tens of thousands of people. Can you make the arrangement for us to pray Dhuhr um, in Jama'ah? Thousands of people praying Dhuhr, right? And Salat al-Ghaib, uh, the, the prayer on the Shuhada. Now, there's a fiqhi difference on Salat al-Ghaib uh, of when you pray upon the deceased from, from afar. But it is far superior to the candlelights and things of that sort, right? Like, I'd rather that we do Salat al-Ghaib when Wadir, uh, Rahimullah, passed away in Chicago and we did a vigil. 
instead of doing like the candlelight vigils where there could be some objection uh, to it from a Shari perspective, said, why don't we just all pull up an image of Wadir and hold up the phone, right? So that, that the imagery of everyone holding up a picture of the boy on their phone um, is far more impactful. Generally, people are going to be receptive, inshallah ta'ala. Um, when they see that you're, you're genuine, you're sincere, you're trying to, uh, you're, you're trying to engage in a way that's, that's thoughtful, you're not going to be able to control everything that everyone's mm-hmm. going to say. You're not going to be able to control everything. Like if you're on that London Bridge, you better believe that there's going to be a, a part of that whole thing that's going to go you know, in a direction that you have no anticipation. By the way, there are paid actors as well. In these protests, one hundred percent. In one of the protests, there was a, a lady, like an elderly lady, that was holding uh, a sign that was very like, um, like it's. Let's just. I don't even want to repeat what was on that sign, but it was it was near to to it's almost like a Nazi type message. You know, she didn't make the sign herself, mm-hmm. and it, it was meant. I, I mean, I knew that she didn't make the sign herself, and I actually confirmed. She's like someone paid her. She's like an older, one of those ladies that begs paid her to hold up the sign. So then right wing media can capture it, put it on, run it. This is what these protests are really about. So you take away from what 10,000 people were saying and you focus on the one woman that was holding a sign that you gave her and you paid her to hold up. So there are paid actors, paid infiltrators, paid agitators. That's one element of this. Another element is that they're just people that don't come to this from an Islamic place, right? There are, especially now, a lot of Jewish uh, anti-occupation groups, right? If not now, Jewish Voice for Peace are like staging like civil disobedience in different places, right? Like they're taking over stations and, um, you know, and, and the moment calls for that type of stuff right now. So I'd say be careful. Try to go with a group, not alone. Try to talk to the organizers in advance. Try to carve out the space, inshallah ta'ala, as much as you can. And I, I believe that the moment in the West right now that this is one powerful tool that we have at our disposal that works in concert with, and with other things. Um, so that doesn't mean that we should completely, you know, uh, just immerse ourselves in what's there. But we also shouldn't cede the space mm. and, and neglect the, the whole concept because it is a powerful tool that's at our disposal. Well, at one point you said that one of the things that we as Muslims can do is sincere dua. But the question that I want to bring up here, and I'm pretty sure a lot of Muslims have this, is how can you get to the place of a sincere dua all the time? Because a lot of times, you know, you still might feel strongly about something, but then you feel like you're making dua, and it's it's almost like you feel like a hypocrite because you're not as sincere. You know something? I could be wrong in my assessment here. But if I was to guess, I would believe that more Muslims are finding the ability to cry now than ever before. Mm. That people are able to really cry, shed tears. And that's one of the means of inkisar, to be broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the means of a sincere dua. Um, I mean, these are unspeakable atrocities, man. Like, subhanAllah, like you see a few images, you, you see a few videos, and they absolutely break your heart, right? So be broken in front of Allah. Be broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. La hawla, Allah, that no one can change a situation. Wa la quwwa, and no one has actual power except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijabah. The Prophet said, call upon Allah while you're certain in the answer. So, be certain in the answer as you're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also know that the one that you are calling upon has far more power than anyone else that is being invoked to intervene and anyone else that is carrying out the aggression. So know who you're talking to in Allah, know his names, know his attributes. But take your brokenness to him. Like, don't just wipe your tears. Verbalize a dua as soon as you start crying. Put the phone down, make dua. Um, be broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the greatest ways that a dua can be accepted is that a person humbles himself and is broken in front of Allah. That's why I'm saying don't do things that harden the heart. I think that people will say like, uh, again, like, oh man, like I need a break from this. I'm going to go watch this show. No, nah, don't do that. Not that all shows are haram, I'm saying, but like in general, like the, you know, what the implication is, I'm going to go do something that's going to make me just completely, my mind off. Yeah, yeah. My decompress, my decompressing always involves, you know, the opposite of what my, my concern is don't do that. Uh, go to the Quran. This is a time to reestablish a relationship with the Quran. Mm. 
Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Wa nunazilu min al-Qur'an ma huwa shifa wa rahmatun lil-mu'minin." That we reveal from the Quran was a cure, and it is a mercy to the believers. One of the benefits of that ayah is it is shifa, it is a healing for you, and it descends as an individual, and it descends mercy upon the collective of the believers. So just reading Quran, like decompress by reading Quran too, and then make dua, right? So I think take your brokenness to the one who mends all things. Take your pain to the one who heals all things. Just take it to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And wallahi, I, I'm serious. Like, here's how I actually mentioned this, and I wasn't going to mention it in a khutbah, but I, I couldn't help myself because there was like, there was a moment where the shaitan almost got me. I was about to make dua, and I was like, who am I to make dua when these blessed people are making dua in Gaza? What's my dua going to do? Like, why even add it on to the mix? Subhanallah. But I realized, I was like, he's trying to disconnect me from making my dua. So don't belittle the deed and don't belittle yourself because you're calling upon Allah Azza wa Jal. So take it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a very good point, subhanAllah. Because I think at the end of the day, it's not about us really. It's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know. Um, obviously, we have to have sincerity, as you mentioned. We have to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala f- from a sincere place and, and really mean and have you know certainty in what we're saying. But at the end of the day, it's like... As long as it's a good uh, believing Muslim who's making du'a, like it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day, you know? And, and a, a part of me almost wants to say that, like if you're doubtful of that du'a, who are you really doubting? You are Allah there. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and keep us safe. I think, unfortunately, I w- Allah would love to keep going. It's an honor having you with us. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we uh, have an event to catch. <laughs> we found out that we're related. <laughs> yes, subhanAllah. Yes, this is, quickly talk about that? I know it's uh, maybe happen. quickly. This is now uh, my, my ummah. <laughs> Not sheikh anymore. Ummah. Ummah. So, ummah like ummah. uncle. Oh, really? <laughs> not as direct on yeah. obviously, but uh, no. So usually, you know, when you meet people from Palestine, you say, "Where are they from?" They they mention these villages that are usually around Ramallah. Yeah. So they'll they'll say these Mizrah, Al Bira, Silwad. I never hear anyone say Tul Karam. So when I asked him, I said, "Where are you from?" He said, "Oh, Palestine, Tul Karam." I looked at him like, "Are you are you serious?" <laughs> and I actually know, like, so our families are 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 are, are within a connected, um, you know, circle. So. He's he's gonna be he's my he's my cousin at some way, uh, he's gonna be somewhere in the in the mix. <laughs> uh, Inshallah, we're gonna we're gonna see Rami at the Suleiman family gatherings now. Inshallah, <laughs> <laughs> y'all are related and y'all are at the same height. Yeah, man, something in the, something in the water and Tuat Karam that our parents. Right, it's a giant. Allahumma barik. Alhamdulillah. Allah make us all giants of the Ummah and be unapologetic in defending our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Allahumma amin. Do we, uh, brother Omar Suleiman, before we wrap this up, do we, do we want to make a quick du'a? Absolutely. No? Absolutely. Inshallah. Ready when you are. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fihi. Hamdan yariqu li jalali wajhi wa li azimi sultani. All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Aziz, Al-Jabbar, Al-Qawi. The one who has all might, the one who has all power, the one who is irresistible, the one who is indestructible. And we bear witness, O Allah, that there's no power, no ability to change except that which is with you. All praises are due to Allah who sent us our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with divine revelation, with a guide for us in our individual lives and our community lives. All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who never fails in his promise. Allah, who never betrays his promise. Ya Rabb, you have promised our brothers and sisters a shahada. You have promised our brothers and sisters victory so long as they stay firm. Ya Rabb, we ask you to grant our brothers and sisters shahada and to grant them victory. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect them from above them, from in front of them, from behind them, from their right and from their left. And we ask you to make the ground firm beneath their feet. Ya Allah, we ask you to descend tranquility and firmness and steadfastness upon their hearts. Ya Allah, and we ask you to provide for them where other people have cut them off. We ask you to heal them where other people have hurt them. We ask you, O Allah, that you allow them to be elevated in their rank in the hereafter and elevated in victory in this life. Ya Allah, and we ask you to show us an example in the oppressors. Allahumma arina fihim ajaib qudratik. Oh Allah, show us a miracle in how you deal with them. Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you, Ya Allah, to destroy those who oppress them, to restrict 
the harm of those who harm them. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Let their own plans betray them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Let their own plots betray them. Ya Allah, they plan and you plan and you are the best of planners, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, let their plans betray them. Ya Rabbil Alameen, let their plans betray them. And Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you for forgiveness for all of the believing men and the believing women, the mustada'afeen, the mankubeen, the weak ones, the downtrodden ones, wherever they are, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you to grant victory to the oppressed, the ones that we know and the ones that we don't know, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And we ask you to gather us all in Jannah the Firdaus with our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the Shuhada, with the Salihin, with the Siddiqeen, with the Prophets along our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what a blessed company that is. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma amin ya Rabbi. Allahumma amin ya Rabbi. Allahumma amin ya Rabbi. Jazakumullah khair. Wa ayakum barakallahu fikum. Inshallah. Man, I'm tearing up too. May Allah bless everybody for tuning in. Inshallah, Sheikh, we got to do this again sometime. Inshallah. Soon, inshallah. Yeah. How does the average Muslim find out more about you? Where can they head? Uh, they can head to yaqeeninstitute.org or the YouTube channel. Alhamdulillah, I know you guys just recorded Imam Tom. So Imam Tom's doing some great stuff there too. Alhamdulillah. And we have a lot of our um, you know, uh, presenters doing some really important stuff to give perspective on Palestine, especially in this moment. So subscribe to our channel, inshallah ta'ala. And bidnillah ta'ala, we'll, we'll keep uh, doing what we can together, bidnillah. Uh, right now is a moment of unity. And so may Allah Azza unite our ranks, unite our hearts, and allow us to be used in useful ways for our brothers and sisters. Jazakallah khair everyone for tuning in May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all immensely Please, please, please share it with everyone And anyone who you can Post it on your social medias To get the message out Again we thank our beloved Imam Omar Salaman for joining us May Allah bless him And um, everyone for that amazing dua Comment hashtag Amin if you made it this far and we'll see you on the next one. Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.